Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My job is to, they make you chairman of the old-timers panel so you can't talk. That's why they made <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, if we get any more water, we're going to do a baptism. Uh, uh, I'm sorry I whined about the water. Uh, uh, anyway, thank you all, for all the water people, thank you very much. Uh, and it's a, it, it's, it's a good job to have here to, uh, uh, to be in the company of these three great participants and to enjoy them and not think about what I might have to say. I just know all three of them, uh, maybe one or two of them better than the others, but I know their reputation. I know uh, the credentials of AA they come here with, and I know fairly well what all three of them do as far as what their home group uh, uh, activity affiliation service uh, is about, and that's really where AA happens, is right there in the home group. I'll just say this. I'm not going to say a lot about the individuals. I'm just going to say I know what it takes for Bill Crawford to be sober to have this thing, and I know everything I do is a necessary ingredient to be sober and to have this gift that we celebrate on occasions and conferences and conventions like this. And I think they, these folks, these participants, will say the same thing. All winners, I found out real early in AA, do pretty much the same thing. They're at the meetings. They are involved, active in, contributing to service work, AA members. They are, uh, they express the spiritual feature freely and adhere to those spiritual requirements or necessities that we do like prayer, meditation, and the giving of our spiritual gift to that person who still suffers. And all of them have uh, not only equipment to do that, but they do that. So I'm going to call on them one at a time and enjoy them like you are going to enjoy them and benefit from their message as will you. Uh, Right from the capital of our state, where the convention is often in Raleigh, I want to introduce a good AA member, the pillar of Raleigh AA, Jim H. Thank you, Bill. My name is Jim, and I'm not all of my separated birthday is July the 31st, 1978. I'm a member of the principal's group in Raleigh. We are one group that meet twice a week. Tuesday night at our closed discussion meeting and Thursday night at our open speaker meeting. Both meetings begin at, 12, at 8 p.m. On the first Tuesday of each month, we read and discuss the chapter from the Big Book of Alcoholic Anonymous. On the second and third Tuesday of the month, we pick topics from AA literature that are conference approved. And she and I experience strength and hope around that. <clears throat> On the fourth Tuesday, we study a tradition in conjunction with the, with the month. When there's a fifth Tuesday, we will uh, study a history. And on the Thursday, is our open speaker meeting. And when there's a fifth Thursday, we'll do a workshop. We are located at 4400 Buffalo Road, Raleigh, North Carolina. If you're ever in the area, look us up. We would love to have you. I would like to thank Bill Crawford for his uh, kind words. Uh, thank the committee for inviting me down. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I like the theme. Uh, <clears throat> this year, uh, you picked a good theme. In the spirit of the fellowship, I uh, think that's what it is, and I'm a member of this fellowship, 
I'm not a member of the rooms. I didn't come into the rooms. I come into the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous and uh, join. They say I'm a member of Alcoholic Anonymous. When I say that I'm a member of Alcoholic Anonymous, I'd like to thank the committee for recognizing me as uh, qualified to be on the old timers uh, panel. Uh, I'm almost over uh, 32 years, will be uh, 32 years, the 31st day of this month, and it's because of uh, just what Bill Crawford said, it's because of a home group and uh, good sponsorship and old timers that have gone on before me, uh, such as my sponsor that's sitting here and just thinking about that, I'm under a lot of pressure with him being right on the front row, but I, I'm going to do the best I can to, uh, to get through that. And he, he's a, he's a fine example of Alcoholic Anonymous and, uh, a great, uh, sponsor and, uh, always been a good member of Alcoholic Anonymous and, once I was sharing with him about that, I wanted to be just like him and follow his footsteps. And uh, there ain't no gaps in his sobriety, you know, with his attendance to uh, the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous. And uh, his response to that was that uh, he didn't have nothing else to do <laughs> but come here, you know. And I found out that to be very true, you know. Uh, can't give me any credit for sticking with my home group and being here. I ain't got nowhere else to go. <clears throat> I didn't know I didn't have anywhere else to go, you know, but it, it's so true. Uh, they told me when I got here that that I they recommended that I come to the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous, and I was wondering why did they recommend that, and they said that uh, I didn't have no other place to go. You know, well, I knew that that wasn't true. I was living with a woman that I hated. (laughs) She was making over $35,000 a year at the time. I had a brother that had just got an insurance settlement and had a brand new Oldsmobile and a new apartment, and I had the key to both of those places. And they telling me, that I didn't have no other place to go, you know. But the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous helped me understand that they were right about that. You know, I didn't have no other place that I could go and stay sober. You know, and that that is very that was very true then, and that is very true now. That uh, this is the only place that I know that I can go and stay sober. You know, and staying sober in the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous have gave me uh, great opportunities. And the opportunities that it gave me to uh, do something with my life. And the thing that I needed to do with my life was to clear away the records of the past. You know, what a great opportunity that was. You know, that's in the eighth step of Alcoholic Anonymous in the 12 and 12 where it talks about that uh, any forward progress I must first wrench backward. You know, and that, that's also true in, in my life. I heard the speaker talk about last night how disrespectful I was to my parents. And it wasn't because of the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous. I was able to understand who those people was. When I came into the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous with no other place to go and getting introduced into the fellowship and learning how to, uh, what this was all about, and I was a good mixer. I came into the fellowship and got a whole bunch of new friends, found new places to go, was quite comfortable in the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous, and people just loved me, it seemed, at each meeting because they would remember me from one meeting to the next one. 
And I thought that what what a, what, what a great thing they, they they still remember me. You know, my name is Jim. It's only three. Who wouldn't remember that? <laughs> but you know, I got how effective that was, and uh, you you never uh, uh, slighted me. And I just had to become very comfortable setting up in the fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous and just very comfortable with you. And I caught on to that word. I hear people in the fellowship refer to the group as they family. You know, and I, I caught on to that too to somebody told me that we ain't your family, Jim. You know, you're in a fellowship with us. You got a family out there somewhere, and you need to go do something about uh, uh, reconciling with your family. And I've I've never said an alcoholic anonymous since that time that you are my family. I got a family. I came from a family. I'm one of twelve kids that lived to die. I accused my father of raising his own slaves, you know. He had to <laughs> grow up on a farm, and the more kids you had, the more people you had to work, you know. And there's a lot of work on a farm, and uh, I heard people say that uh, they always known that they was an alcoholic. Uh, I didn't know that I was an alcoholic till I got here. I always known that I was going to drink. Because all of the men in my family drank. All of the women in my family ever brought a man in, brought one in that drank. And uh, I didn't want to be a boy. I always wanted to be a man. And uh, my first encounter with alcohol was a total disaster. You know, and I thought that I would never, ever be able to be a man like the rest of the men in my family was because I was scared to drink again. But the book talks about that men and women drink a century for the effect, you know. And uh, quiet as it was, there must have been some kind of, of an effect to that alcohol that time that made me go back. As sick as I was, I didn't recognize the effect. But the way that I can kind of make sense out of that today I got into my grandmother's garret snuff that almost killed me. I ain't dipped in his snuff since. I work in Wilson, North Carolina, and I can smell that stuff and snuff and get sick. But alcohol wasn't like that. I went back for alcohol, uh, and, and, and regardless of how sick it made me, I would always go back to it. And the only thing that I can attribute that to is the effect that alcohol had on me. But I did get to the excitement stages of alcoholism and, and I became the life of the party and people liked it having me around and I would get invited to different places but as my alcoholism continued, it got to what that, you know, I, I couldn't control my drinking and I become violent and I wouldn't work and I steal for a living and I thought that whatever I could steal and get away with it was rightfully mine and, you know, and I, I adopted that type of life and robbing people's and got caught with a gun in somebody else's store and you know they they they'll say that is robbery and they sent me off to the penitentiary and you know uh that nothing changed by all of that because I uh, had never done no me I never thought about my alcoholism now I've uh, thought about doing a lot of things and making a whole lot of changes but I have never had a conscious decision to try to stop drinking. I wanted to make some changes, but all the changes that I was going to make, 
I was going to make those changes with the aid of alcohol. And I didn't get the desire or the idea to stop drinking until I got with another alcoholic and they shared their experience, uh, strength and hope with me and were able to help me to point out, you know, uh, what my problem was with alcohol. And I'd be internally grateful for the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous because I had never had that desire uh, uh, to not drink until I got to the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous. You know, I got sober still with a desire to drink. And that was absolutely the effect that your experiences, uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, attending the meetings of uh, Alcoholic Anonymous and uh, clearing away the records of my past and building up a new life and making amends to my family and those people that I stole from and all that good stuff and how the desire, uh, the compulsion and desires to drink alcohol left me. And I could be sitting in meetings and just listening to others and tell that that desire to drink is slipping away. You know, and I knew with the help of the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous, I was going to be able to surrender to the, the, the illness of alcoholism. And that's where the hope of the second step came in. I saw hope through uh, the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous. What it looked at like at first was a big desire, a big challenge that you had put up on me. And what my sick thinking was that I was thinking that I, you were saying that you could stay sober, but I couldn't. And I thank God that I met up with that challenge, and I'd be internally grateful to you uh, and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the literature and all of the meetings that I attend. And it takes all of that, and then all of that has something to do with me drinking or not drinking. It's got something to do with a new way of life after being a drunk like me, you know, and I'd be internally grateful for that. Now, there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes on in the world that I'm probably interested in, but it's secondary interest. I'm interested in a way that I can stay sober and live a life of joyous happiness and free a uh, day at a time, and I have found that way in the Fellowship of Alcoholic Anonymous, and I am internally grateful for that, and God bless you, and thank you for listening. And Jim, thank you. That was great. And brief, too. I'm telling you, I didn't even have to. I didn't even have to tell him to be brief. That was time. I uh, did not. I was asked to uh, mention my home group, and I did not. And I apologize. I'm a member of the Starmount group. Been a member of the Starmount group for a long, long time in Greensboro. Saturday night, big speaker meeting in Ladybug, and uh, you're welcome to to be with us on any Saturday you find yourself in Greensboro. Uh, Thanks to Jim, as I already said, and the next speaker is a friend of mine, been a friend of mine a long time. She's a she's a member of AA you see everywhere. She's a conference junkie, and uh, <laughs> I am one too, so uh, we've known each other a while, and I know her to be a good member of AA and everything that that means. So the absolute rock of Raleigh AA, <laughs> Lady Bunn. I'm a lady and I'm an alcoholic. Now, I don't ever stand up here and say I'm nervous, so let me tell you this story. I walk into the elevator. Some people have already said this, too. 
I'm walking to the elevator and I said, oh, God, please don't let me make a fool of myself. I said, God, I'm not, I'm not supposed to say that. I said, okay, God, you take over and you don't make a fool of yourself. And I thought, no, no, that's not going to work. So I started laughing. Um, my sobriety date is August the 6th of 1979. For that, I am truly grateful. Um, I want to thank you for asking me to come wherever you are. There you are. <laughs> Um, I was um, thinking over when, when Jim was talking, and you know, whenever I listen to someone else talk, it always brings back these memories of the way, of the way it used to be. And, and I was thinking that um, uh, I drank, and I, I went to this meeting this morning about the Fellowship of the Spirit, and it started reminding me of all the gifts, again, that I have gotten in AA. Not just what, what people have given me, but what you have taught me to be able to give. And, and that, to me, is the most important thing, because I was always a taker. And so for me, for you to be able to teach me to be able to give, y'all were always my models since I've come in. And, um, and it is just awesome to me to sit up here where my heroes sit, you know. And I asked Dave before I came, I said, what am I going to say? Tell me, tell me what to do. He says, well, I, I've forgotten. He said something like, kill him dead or something like that. <laughs> that was no help. <laughs> um, I drank alcohol because it made me feel good. I didn't particularly like the taste of it. I just liked the feel of it. It made me feel good. It made me feel normal. And I don't, didn't know that then. I'm looking back and, and knowing that that's, that's what it was. It made me feel normal. And, and I figured that a little bit more would make me feel better than normal. And, and that's, that's where it was with me. And, and I, as long as I can remember, I have rom, rom, romanticized alcohol because I grew up in a family <laughs> where my mom and my dad drank daily. And neither one of them were alcoholics. It was just what they did. They would drink one or two cocktails before dinner every night. And so that was a normal thing for me to um, think was, you know, what was a normal thing to do. So as I um, grew up, um, I looked for every opportunity I could to get something to drink. But I was 24 years old when I started drinking on a daily basis. Up until then, it was just you know, weekend kind of stuff. And from the time I was 24 until the time I was 36, I drank every single day. And my experience with alcohol was the gradual degradation of everything that was kind and decent and loving in my fam- in my life. Everything that was important to me took second seat to alcohol. It was the most important thing in my life. And, uh, and I had become so dependent on it, I didn't realize any longer that I no longer felt good at drinking alcohol. <laughs> I just didn't know any other way. And I eventually became so sensitized to it that one, oh, I don't know, two ounce glass of sherry would just make me go crazy. And I didn't, I didn't get drunk or anything like that. I just would go crazy. And, uh, and I didn't realize that it was alcohol making me do this. I thought that it was the circumstances around me and my family, especially my husband, of course, <laughs> you know, that was making me have to turn to alcohol. To, and that that was what made my life bearable. And I was uh, going to a psychologist, and I know a lot of y'all don't do that, but I was going to a psychologist, and um, and I would come away, and I would start feeling better, and I'd go home, and I'd celebrate, and have a a glass of sherry or something, and and my and I would go down into the depths of depression, and that's when it first occurred to me that maybe one of my problems was alcohol. Until then, I didn't think that was a solution. It wasn't. It wasn't the problem. And um, my brother was in AA, and um, I was so glad because he had needed it. But he, <laughs> he had gotten a little weird <laughs> since he quit drinking. And uh, and he would come over every now and then and, and check out me. And um, and he watched me go downhill real fast for three years. And he was very instrumental in me coming into Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I think that God plants things in my mind that then come, and I think it's an original idea. And I was over at his house one night, and I stopped one afternoon, and he wasn't supposed to be there, and his wife was. And it's those series of coincidences, which I think, to me, are always so important for me to remember that God was looking after me long before I believed in him. You know, he's there whether I I think he is or not. 
And, uh, and I stopped in the middle of a step, and I turned back around, and I said, tell me something about AA. Well, now, up until then, he had never said a word to me about my drinking. And uh, after that, um, he wouldn't answer any questions. He kept saying, come on, let's go to a meeting, let's go to a meeting, because he knew I wanted to find out all about it before I even graced the doors, you know. I wanted to know whether or not. And um, he took me to my first meeting, and that's when I realized, um, you know, this sounds so hokey that um, that I had that I had come home and I had found something that I had always wanted all my life. And I've heard other speakers say that they felt like they went through life without a road map, without un, without everybody had directions except for me. And when I heard the steps, and this is so dumb, I mean, I, I look back and I think, yeah, but it's the way it was. I read the steps, I heard the steps, and I thought, oh my gosh, there's my road map. There's my road map. And you know, and you ended the meeting with the, with the, with the serenity prayer, and I thought, oh my goodness. Because you see, I had grown up with this prayer on the wall of my bedroom, and I didn't, didn't know anything about it. When I went to that psychologist, I said, tell me something about accepting things. I can't accept anything. And I had become a non-functional mother. I had become a non-functional employee. I had become a non-functional wife. And a non-functional daughter. And alcohol, I'm telling you, completely consumed me. I sat at home and I drank until I couldn't, get, until I passed out, went back upstairs and would sleep it off and come back down so I could drink some more. And when my children, who were the most important thing in my life, came to me, I'd tell them to go away and leave me alone. And that, that's where alcohol took me, to filled with such rage and such self-hatred and such disgust with me that it spilled out over onto my opinion of you and everything and everybody around me. And I got the first hope I'd ever had in my life when I went to my first AA meeting. And I wasn't, on the one hand, I knew I was where I was supposed to be. And on the other hand, I wasn't sure I wanted you. I was so scared. And at the end of the meeting, that, by the way, that serenity prayer belonged to my grandfather. He was a, he was a sober member of AA when he died. And my other grandfather was locked up in a back room drunk. And I had no idea that there was any alcoholism in my family until I'd been sober for three days, for three years. And uh, after the meeting was over, I had, you know, they pass out chips. Well, I wasn't going to get a chip. I knew that that meant commitment. <laughs> and I wasn't willing to commit to anything. And they came up to me, and they literally forced a white chip into my hand, and I walked away with the first resentment I was aware of. <laughs> and... Um, and Edward had warned them I was coming, so they were prepared. <laughs> and it was a small group, and um, and I knew some of the people. And they spent the whole meeting talking about how not to take a drink. And a lot of the things I don't hear now about orange juice and honey and all that kind of stuff and sweets and all the things like that. And they, they, they used to kind of do a group kind of sponsor, and they called me. And Everett told me that I needed to get a sponsor, and he said, you need to hang out with the winners. And he, he took me out, and he introduced me to Edith. Now, Edith was this wonderful woman. A lot of you know her, remember her. And, and she had um, white hair, and she was kind and gentle and hard as nails. And, and I went out, and she lived out in the country, and I interviewed her. <laughs> and... and <laughs> And um, she knew what I was doing, and uh, I decided that she would do. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, she had the best way of telling me the things that I needed to hear in a way that I could hear them. Because if I felt threatened, I would, these chills would come down, and I couldn't hear what she was saying. And I learned early on to take the things that were so scared to me because if you told me the truth, it hurt, and I couldn't react to it, and I was in denial. And I would take those things, and I would put them back on the back of my head on this little shelf, and I'd go home till I was all by myself, and I, and I would call them, and I would pull it out, and I'd look at it to see, did that really apply to me? And you know, most of the time it did. But she said things to me like, honey, I went running to her, and I said, Edith, everybody's talking about guilt, and I don't, I don't understand that. I said, do you think I ought to feel guilty because I don't feel guilty? And, and she said, honey, you wear me out. <laughs> and I remember, I remember um, 
uh, she took me to the Camp Monroe, and that's how she sponsored me into service, and she sponsored me into to retreats, and she sponsored me into um, uh, conventions and conferences. And one of the the first retreat I ever went to was Camp Monroe, and I remember she asked me if I would like to read how it works. And I got up there, and I said, oh, yes, I'd be so honored. And and I went up there, and I stood on the stage, and I read, I emoted. Now, I was I was a drama queen, and, and, I, and I said, rarely have we seen a person fail, <laughs> you know. And uh, and I got I got off off of the stage, and I said, how was it? She said, well, you honey, you read it with some feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so I look back on the lessons that I that I learned in in my sobriety. You know, she got me into the steps right away. She got me into sponsoring other people right away. You know, uh, and she got me into in, into service work, and and I, I did the GSR and the DCM, and I was on the area uh, committee. I was secretary back when secretary and registrar were the same. I covered for Everett because Everett. I covered for Everett. I stepped in. That's what it was, and it was a wonderful experience. But I, I was a little, thinking back when Jim was talking about growing up in AA, and how I've had so many opportunities to grow. That's a nice way to say I got myself into messes that then I had to figure out what I was going to get good out of. And some of it was messes that I knew I got into because I wanted to, regardless of what you said. And the others were messes that I accidentally got into. <laughs> but um, there's the things that um, I was, I'm, I know I'm jumping around, but. One of the things that I want to tell you that has really, really stood me in good stead that Edith told me. You see, when I did my first inventory, I left one thing off, and she told me what it was. <laughs> and uh, she said, um, I said, I think I got it all. And she said, well, I think you forgot one. And I said, what? She said, arrogance. I said, me? I'm not me? <laughs> she said, she said, Yes, and and one of the things, because you see, I was a good study. I learned all the right things to say. I would read all these books, and I was really good at throwing it back at you. And people thought I was a whole lot more sober than I was, and and I did too. <laughs> and she looked at me one day, and she said, "Honey," she said, "You know a whole lot more than you understand." And I thought about that. And I have thought about that for 30 years, because that was pretty early in my sobriety. I've thought about that for 30 years. I've never forgotten it. And, you know, what I heard her say originally was that you can't understand something until you've experienced it. That's the first thing that I got out of what she said. But the other thing, which took me years and years and years to hear, was that when I know it all, I can't hear what it is that you're trying to tell me. And if I can't hear what you're trying to tell me, then I'm not teachable. And uh, and I try to remember that all the time today. And I try to be teachable because one of my greatest character defects is pride. And if I'm eating up with pride, then I can't be wrong. And if I can't be wrong, then you can't be right. And if you can't be right, then I can't learn. And, you know, I know today that I need you more today than I've ever needed you. There's a, we talked about the fellowship of the Spirit. I have discovered women. Now, I know you guys already know about women, but I discovered women. I didn't have women, women friends. I, they are so close to my heart. They mean so much to me today. They give me their, you know, they have given my life more meaning than anything in this world, other than the people that I sponsor. And they were women, too, and they are women that let me into their lives. And I am so honored that they let me be a part of their life. Um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I don't know how, how to go about telling you how grateful I am to be alive how more normal I am today than I've ever been in my whole life.
And I still do things that I shouldn't do. Uh, it's just that, I don't know, maybe I enjoy him more. <laughs> One of the greatest gifts that I've gotten in, other than sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous is the ability to laugh at myself and to find joy in the day and to find joy in the people around me. And um, I want to thank you because that's the gift that you've given me. Thank you. And I want to thank you, lady. That was just dynamite, and I appreciate it. As always, you uh, brought me something I needed to hear and needed to know. Uh, Jim is uh, going to be last but not least. Uh, he is, uh, he is as I described the others, he is uh, in AA, part of AA, an AA member not only in good standing, but one that we can all uh, look at as an example of what good AA is about. So he's the spiritual anchor of Durham AA. I give you Jim T. I'm an alcoholic. I'm Jim. Hi. It's two hard acts to follow, and uh, I don't compare myself to them. Uh, my sobriety date is July 27th, 1972, and I'm a member of the Upfront Group in Durham. Um, I've got the disease of alcoholism. I never started out to have it, didn't want it. Uh, I saw what it did to some uncles that I had. When I was a sophomore in high school, I had a very deep experience with God, and I asked him every morning to help me do the best I could that day, and... Uh, Every night I'd ask him for stuff. And we got along really well for a couple of years. And uh, it was a setup. Because, uh, and I didn't know any better. And then looking back on it, it, it happened the way it was supposed to happen. Because the day that I knew that God wasn't going to come through for me for the most important thing for me, I denounced him and wasn't going to have any more to do with him. Didn't want him to have anything to do with me. And I went on my merry way. Uh, self will run riot. I went away to college in the fall of my freshman year. I uh, got a pint of whiskey, and a friend of mine got a pint of whiskey, and we went to Varsity Theater in Chapel Hill. We saw the movie Ulysses, and by the time I finished that pint, it was Cinerama, and they, <laughs> the, the, the skeletons were fighting on the deck of the ship, and uh, we went to the student union. I danced with the girl. I hadn't done that before, and I I think I talked to her the way I'd always more dreamed about talking to a girl, and, and that happened, and I, I felt that I could dance as good as anybody, and I was as good as anybody there, and I had the whirly beds that night, I had a blackout, and I was sick as the devil the next morning, but I remembered how good it felt for that brief period, and I believe I looked for that for the next nine years that I drank. I uh, got locked up for public drunkenness. Uh, about a year later, I uh, plunked out of college several times. I'd get back in just before I'd get the draft notice, and, uh, and that, that went on, and it, life was rough. So I uh, got a job in a chemistry lab and discovered that we had 190 proof grain alcohol. It's called Everclear, and a 55-gallon drum with the spigot on it. So... Uh, <laughs> For the next six years, I had plenty to drink whenever I wanted to drink it. And some days I didn't remember leaving work, and I don't know how in the world I kept that job. I uh, went to my boss. I had the same boss for, for all that time. And uh, after I got an AA, I, I went to him to, to try to make some amends. And he said he never saw in any way how it affected my work. And I thought, my goodness. <laughs> well, I got a DUI in 1971, and I had heard that anybody that got one of those had a problem with alcohol. So I had the self-knowledge, and I stopped drinking. And I was miserable for about nine months until uh, 
my, my wife and I agreed that, uh, well, she suggested that maybe if I had a few cans of beer when I got home, we could get along better. And, and she immediately uh, became much, much more intelligent than I'd ever given her credit for. <laughs> and my drinking was worse. It was worse. It had gotten worse even though I hadn't been drinking. And uh, July of 1972, I remember laying in bed and thinking about that time I had in high school and how good my life was. And, and I took a look at how my life was at that moment, and it was not good. Things were not good. Um, and that's about it. I thought wistfully that, that I wished that, that I could get back in, in, in good graces with God, but I figured that couldn't happen because I figured he wouldn't want me back and, and he might send me off to be a missionary in Guana or somewhere and I wouldn't like that. So, But I realized one day that at work that I wasn't going to make it to bedtime without a drink and I had stopped drinking for a week. And I knew that I couldn't drink. Because I couldn't get high anymore. I got, just got knee walking drunk. I didn't know about any other chemicals. I just never was around them. I didn't know about them. And, um, uh, so this particular day at work, I had the phone number of somebody at Dot H in Durham in my pocket. And I had it in my pocket for almost a week and I called her and I followed her to my first AA meeting. And I had decided that if you people told me that I had to go downtown Durham and stand on my head in the fountain that had it five points, I would do it. I agree. Just made up my mind. I'd do whatever you said. Because uh, I was hurting so bad I couldn't stand it. And that first meeting, before the meeting was halfway over, I realized that I was not the only person in the world that felt the way I felt. And that here was a group of people just like me. They were happy. And maybe I could get this thing. And my biggest fear was when they gave out the chips that they wouldn't let me have a white one. But they graciously let me have a white chip. And the man who was my first sponsor after the meeting, he says, Jim, I don't know whether you believe in God or not. Don't care. But you thank him tonight. You haven't had a drink. And you ask for help in the morning to go one day without a drink. And he just as well as slapped me up the side of the head with two before because that's not what I wanted to hear. And, and, and there was a part of me that just wanted to run, but then I thought, well, I agreed, told myself that I'd do whatever it said. So I went home and I did what he said to do. And as far as I was concerned, those prayers didn't go any higher than the ceiling. And I, I, I asked him how often I should go to meetings. He said, how often did you drink? So uh, we had that settled. And, uh, <laughs> so I got a big book. And a 12 and 12, and I started reading. And uh, and the first step, I didn't have too much trouble with. The second step, well, maybe. Maybe the group could, could restore me to sanity. The third step, I read in the 12 and 12. And at the end of that chapter in the 12 and 12 is the serenity prayer. And they added a line, thy will not mine be done. And I said, can't do that. Can't do that. Because I still resented God. I was afraid of him. Afraid to... To, to go back there. So uh, I just rocked along. I did a fourth step and a fifth step and, and, and started working on the eighth and ninth steps. And the 12 and 12 admonishes me that if I skip on this step, I will not get the benefit the rest of the program has to offer. And I said, oh, pooey. And uh, I said, well, I'll go back to school and get my degree. And I had met a young lady in AA, and I said, well, I'll get get my degree and get married, and everything will be fine. And it wasn't. I got my degree. It took five years, taking one course a semester. I had to make all A's to, to get a degree, and I, I just scraped by. You have to have a 2.0 average to graduate, and I got a 2.01. So... Uh, and I continued to work in chemistry. I, I loved chemistry. I, I, I did that work for 42 years. I, I just looked forward to going to work every day because it was, they, I couldn't believe they paid me to do what I did. And uh, so, going to meetings every night, studying, um, and it just it just didn't look like this thing was working too well for me. I, I wasn't wasn't as happy on the inside as I saw you were on the outside. 
And that's not a good comparison, but that's the way it was. And I tell this because, not that I'm proud of my struggles, but uh, that someday somebody will hear something and, and relate to it, and it might save their life too. So uh, I started having periods of what I look at today as depression. And, and uh, so by a series of good coincidences, I went to see the psychiatrist and uh he absolutely refused to give any kind of pills to an alcoholic. He just says, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, so, so we, 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 he kept me alive, kept me alive. And, uh, about my ninth year, I just about figured out this thing wasn't going to work for me. And I was different. And this wasn't going to make it. And I had been thinking, thinking about ways to get relief. And the only thing I could figure was suicide. And I had thinking about it every day, didn't tell anybody about it, but thought about it every day. And one night I went to a meeting, and I left that meeting feeling much worse than when I went there, and that had never happened. And I went home, and we had a garage, and had two vehicles in the garage, and I started up the engines, and I sat down between the tailpipes and just waited for, for relief. And I heard a voice that says, this is not the way out either. And there wasn't anybody out there but me. And obviously I didn't die. Because I, I heard that voice and, 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 and uh, turned the engines off and got out of there. And I uh, went to my sponsor's house the next day and uh, went down in his basement. Richard, there's at least one person in here who remembers Richard. Got on my knees and, and I prayed that third step prayer and I meant it. And when I walked out of there, it was just like I had walked through what I thought was a brick wall and there was nothing there. I just stepped through, and the brick wall is in my mind, and that's what it took for me to break through there and uh, and realize that a loving, forgiving God that you taught me about would take me back in, and he'd take care of me, and, and if I'd let him, and um, gradually the promises started to be fulfilled in my life, and all of them have. Now, life has not been a bed of roses. Uh, about it was three years ago, my uh, marriage of 20 years broke up. We were, we were on absolutely good terms, and it was an, it was a mutual thing. But uh, the only change I like is change in my pocket, mm-hmm. and uh, so that was a huge change, huge, huge, huge adjustment. We have a 20 year old daughter. She's the apple of my eye, right beside my 43-year-old daughter, who's the other apple of my eye. They're wonderful, wonderful young women, just as proud of them as I could be. And, and they, uh... So I kind of got used to that a little bit, and then uh, this job, I've been work, working for 42 years, and I was looking forward to working at least another eight years. And uh, the company I worked for... Uh, as a drug called Avandia, which was not faring well, and they decided to cut out 50% of research. And, uh, and because of my age, only because of my age, um, I was one of the ones that let go. So I know what it's like. to I've been through two mergers, fine. But I know what it's like to um, to lose a job. Now, luckily for me, I was old enough that I could just step into retirement. But... Um, a couple of things happened to, to get me through all that. One was, before the marriage ended, five newcomers came to me wanting to do the steps. And that took up every night of the week that I wasn't in an AA meeting. And they, they kept me going. They kept me going very well. They kept me grateful. And then uh, we knew this layoff thing was coming, and, and I was concerned about it, not overly worried, because I couldn't think of any reason for me to let for him to let me go. Didn't think about the age thing. And uh but it occurred to me one day on the way to work that uh what I need comes to me from God and it just happened to be coming through that company at the time. And that somehow or the other he would he would take care of stuff. And here I was, I had a daughter getting ready to start college. And uh and wasn't gonna have the income that I've been used to. 
next thing I know, I found out her college is paid for. And it's just, it's been like that all through my sobriety. I cannot innocently worry about money. I can't innocently worry about anything. Doesn't mean I don't worry about it sometimes, but I can't innocently worry about it. So today, I, I have a conscious contact with God. I, I when I, when I, right after I had broken through that wall between me and the third step, I had been to see Wade twice in one weekend. Been to Greensboro twice, and he told me the first time I went to bring my big book when I came back, and uh, he opened it up to the end of chapter four. We agnostics and underlined the last sentence. It says, as we drew near to Him, He revealed Himself to us. And sometime, I don't know when it was, it was years ago, I had a dream one night that I was sitting in God's lap, and I can't tell you what he looked like, but I can tell you what it felt like. It was perfect peace, perfect safety, and, and it just, perfect comfort, perfect everything. And, um, and that's the thing I thought about ten years ago when I was getting ready to go into surgery to have my get my heart plumbed up differently so I could survive because they told me if I'd have waited a couple more days to go to the doctor that I wouldn't would have had a heart attack and I wouldn't have made it so so God has done so much for me and I could stand here all afternoon and tell you stuff that he's done that's that's, uh, stuff that I couldn't imagine even trying to do for myself and it's because of you people and I see God and feel God in every one of you and uh, if I could go back and change anything at all, all of my life up to now, I wouldn't do it. And there's been some stuff that that, that I might consider, but I, I wouldn't change it because I might not turn out the way I am today. Thank you so much. Jim, that was great. Thank you. And you followed those tough acts pretty doggone good, and I appreciate it. Um, you know, if you listen to these winners, uh, these old-timers, you hear that coming from that desperate background that we all come from, that hopelessness to hope and that peace and comfort that we enjoy much of the time uh, after a lot of years. And being here and being part of this brings us to good purpose and brings us that comfort and that brings us those things that we, as Jim said, that we tried to shortchange ourselves in, in our history. But if you listen to folks like Lady and the two Jims, you'll hear there's a sense of urgency. Not that they go around afraid they're going to be drunk all the time. Uh, they're not that constant fear of drinking. I don't mean that. But a sense of urgency knowing, like I know, that all the good things that come from this program, all the good benefits of the meeting, all the, the community that we have, the friends, first and foremost, I know if I'm not here in places like this, with people like you to remind me of what I must do to have this thing, I'll drink again. may not be tomorrow, next week, or next month, or whatever, but I'll drink again. And that sense of urgency, which is not uncomfortable, it's a sense of urgency that is beneficial and good and keeps me coming back and knowing that I not only want to be here, but I must be here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.